Today, we're going to be talking about something that's talked about a lot in Christian circles, but may not really be understood as it applies to our life. And that is God's call on our life, that we're called to obey the Lord. We're called to follow the Lord. We're called to serve Him. But what does that calling look like? And what are the steps? Today, we're going to talk about five steps that are necessary in answering God's call in our life. And we're going to see those five steps fulfilled in the prophet of Isaiah in the sixth chapter. And we're going to also think about those five steps as it applies to us answering God's call on our lives. And we'll do that when we come right back. Hi, and welcome to Bible Study with Friends, where our goal is to help you get more impact from your Bible study. We show you how we study the Word, how we mark our Bibles, and even more importantly, how we apply it to our lives. And I'm here with my friend, Jake Curtis, and Jake and I are continuing our study in the book of Isaiah. And if it's been a blessing, subscribe, hit the like button, and we'll get into this. Today, we're going to be talking, Jake, about, we're going to be in the sixth chapter, and we're going to be talking about the commissioning of Isaiah as a prophet of God. And in a broader sense, it's a picture of the five steps that are necessary in answering God's call in our life. We've talked about, are, are you called? There's a certain set of steps that are really necessary for us to go through in order to answer what God is calling us to do. We're going to cover those five steps today uh, as we go along. You ready to get going? Yeah, I'm ready. This is a very interesting chapter for a number of reasons. Uh, we can look at the very first verse. Let's do that together. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Now, there's a couple of, of things that some scholars go nuts on as we talk about this. The first is this kind of question of why is this chapter here after five chapters of the prophecy of judgment on Israel? And then all of a sudden it pops down this story of how he is commissioned, right, as a prophet. So some scholars, uh, especially liberal scholars, will say this just proves that when Isaiah is giving the first five chapters, he's not really a prophet yet, because it's hmm. after chapter six he becomes a prophet. That doesn't quite hold up. And they say that if you look at chapter one, in fact, read chapter one, verse one. Just flip over to that in Isaiah. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Okay, now. He says, I got called to give this message during the days of these kings. Yep. And the first one, Uzziah. It doesn't say that what time of their reign. It just says, I'm giving this message during their reign. So in verse 1 of chapter 6, when it says it, it was in the year of Uzziah's death, that's a 12-month span that he could have been commissioned to prophesy during the last 12 months of Uzziah's life. Just because it says that doesn't mean, oh, this came after his death. It just says that it was during that year of his death. That makes mm -hmm. sense? Sounds so so I, I read that, that it's, that is not a statement that this happened after Uzziah's death. I think that's more of a stretch than what it really says is this happened during the last year of Uzziah's life. It talks about the next chapter is going to talk about the, the next king, and this is going to be the next prophecy. So hmm. that clears this up right away. There's some other things that the scholars go, look, at. it says, in the year of Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne lofty and exalted, 
with the train of his robe filling the temple. Now, it's interesting here. It says, he saw the Lord, right? Yeah. Now, that he does not see God. Yeah, so it's, it's the Lord, which would be Jesus. Because you, you can't see God. In fact, I said in those verses right above that, John 1, 18 and 1 Timothy 6, 16 says, nobody has ever seen God except by seeing Jesus. So any time in the Old Testament, when we're looking and it talks about the hand of God or somebody sees God's shoulders or somebody will say, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, that is not God the Father because you can't see God the Father. He is spirit, as is mm. the Holy Spirit. So when we see a manifestation of a physical aspect of God, that is the pre-incarnate Christ. Christ doesn't be created when he's born. Christ is eternal as one of the members of the triune God, but he is the only physical manifestation of the triune God. He's the only one that has a body. So whenever we see a body, we see the Lord sitting on a throne. We're not seeing God sitting on the throne. We're seeing the pre-incarnate Jesus sitting on the throne. That makes sense? Yeah, that makes sense. He sees Jesus on the throne. And then a lot of the scholars say he's sitting on the throne and his robe covers the entire temple. There's this big discussion whether Isaiah is in the temple in Jerusalem or not. Is he inside the temple? Is he outside the temple? Is he around the temple? Well, the fact that he's in the temple, does that mean he's a priest? Does that mean it doesn't say he's a priest? There's just all this discussion. But what I go by is this. Wherever God's presence is the temple, it's not sense. the physical temple in Jerusalem. It never says that. It just says that where God's throne is the temple, and that's in agreement with all of the places, Daniel, Ezekiel, all of them that mention God's throne room, is that's the temple. So the physical that's temple it... on earth is just a representation of the heavenly temple. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I wonder if that's where Air Force One got their call signal from and the idea from is the only airplane that the president's on is Air Force One. Any yeah, other plane as steps as, off, it's something else. As soon else. as God is there, that's the temple. <laughs> but the heavenly father stays in the temple Jesus is at his right hand, sitting on the throne. So a lot of the skeptics that talk about this, they're trying to make assumptions, not based upon what it actually says, but based upon kind of their thinking. When it says throne, for example, in, in 1 Kings, we're not going to look them up, but 1 Kings 22, 19, I put them right here, and Ezekiel 1, 26 to 28, and Daniel 7, 9 through 10, all talk about the throne room of God with God sitting on the throne. And whenever we see God on the throne, that's the pre-incarnate Jesus. So the Lord is there. And it says that throne is lofty, and all that means is it's high and exalted. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 33, and Acts chapter 5, verse 31, it talks about Jesus is sitting on a throne, and he is exalted above all. So you have that same kind of terminology of he's high and lifted up. He's high and exalted. So what we really see here is Isaiah in the temple of God, in the presence of, I think, all three, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But it's pretty clear that this throne room is a special place that Isaiah is called to, and we can just pay attention to what it says. And there's a lot of verses yeah. that, that really corroborate, corroborate. <laughs> and this idea of God is in his temple and people come, people can be called. It happens to Ezekiel and it happens to Daniel. People can be called into the throne room of God. Now, that throne room, let's, let's go on. Read verse 2 down to verse 4. Okay. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. 
And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. The idea of filling with smoke is back when the people came out of Egypt. Remember the pillar of fire? And whenever God present was in the tabernacle, it yeah. filled with smoke as a symbol of God's presence and power. So here you've got this case where in the throne room, we have the seraphim. Now, the seraphim is interesting because the word seraphim as one of the angels, we have a number of angels, and I have videos of doc the doctrine of angels, if you're interested. There are different ranks to angels. There's archangels, then you've got cherubim, seraphim, and the host of angels. That when angels are described, they're not described with wings, and cherubim are not described with wings, and gar archangels aren't described with wings. But when a seraphim are described, every time it describes them as having six wings. And this is a description of the surroundings of God. The, the angels, the seraphim specifically, are God's personal ministers that stay right by the throne and constantly are worshiping him. Now, it's important that we notice in this worship, in verse 3, one called out to another and said, holy is the Lord of hosts. Now, we've probably talked about this before, but whenever you have a repeated word, like when Jesus really wanted to make a point, he would say, verily, verily, I say to you, right? Yeah. And Whenever you have a repeated word in the Hebrew or the Greek, it is to give real emphasis to that. And here, this repeated word is three times, not twice, but three times. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And that Lord of hosts is a term for the Lord of all the angels. Now, I want to very quickly go through these six steps, and I want to show you this. The first step, Isaiah is in front of the, the throne room and these angels. And the angels are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of his glory. So the first yeah. step of God's call is you have to be confronted by God's holiness. And it's in contrast because right after that, what does he say in verse 5? Woe is me. I'm lost because I am a man of unclean lips. So it's not that the prophet is better than the people around him who are going to be judged for their sin. It's that the prophet is convicted by his sin. So the first step is you got to be confronted by God's holiness. And the second step is to be convicted by your own sin. So you go, woe is me, I'm ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips. Then it says, one of the seraphim flew to me with, this is verse 6, burning a coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Now, there's some really interesting things about those two verses. One is the fact that the seraphim brings the burning coal, right? Now, if you go into Ezekiel and Daniel and you talk about the throne, it talks about the throne being on fire or the throne being a place of flame. So apparently, the angel is called upon to take a piece of the throne of God and touch Isaiah's lips, right? Yeah. Now, that's neat because the word seraphim means burning ones. Oh, and the idea is these angels are the personal uh, worshipers of God. And they are burning with their uh, reverence for the holy God, the seraphim. They're burning ones. So God chooses a burning one to bring this burning coal and touch the lips of the prophet and say, yeah. because of that, your sins are forgiven and you're cleaned, right? Now, a question for us. Who takes the action of forgiving Isaiah of his sin? Does Isaiah do anything? No, Isaiah, no, he doesn't say that he does. He, he doesn't, just, uh, doesn't say he created a fire and 
and took the stall and, and put it to his lips in order to. No, oh. he is convicted of his sin, but then he waits and God takes the action of sending holiness, sending cleansing to him. And he does nothing other than receive it. And in our answering God's call in our life, we've got to be careful that we don't think that our actions are necessary to answer the call of God at that point. We see God's holiness. We're convicted by our lack of holiness. And then we are forgiven. Let's look at this. After you're confronted by holiness and convicted of your sin, you're cleansed by his forgiveness, not deciding to be forgiven, but by God taking the action. This whole thing about lips, by the way, he touched your lips. There's some very great verses I want to give you here, and you can stop the, the video if you want to and look at these, but Psalm 51, 15, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9, and Malachi chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, all talk about the lips of a servant of God being cleansed for good use. Ma Malachi chapter 2, 6 and 7, my, one of my favorites says, the, the man of God, people come to him because his lips are pure. And it's just an interesting thing that God wants to use our lips. Yeah. He wants to use us. Doesn't say God's lips, okay? He wants to use us in the lips. Now, read the next verse. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. All right, what do you see there? It's a question. It's a call. It's a challenge. Okay. And, and who, is, who is asking the question? The Lord. Is asking the question. Now, that brings a, an interesting thing. Stop for a second and think. Does the, or, does the Lord ask the question because he doesn't know? No, he knows. He knows. Then why does he ask the question? So that we know. So that so we, know. we know ourselves. We know our own response. And to give us an opportunity to voluntarily right. answer the question. Yeah. He's, he is giving the question to give Isaiah the chance to say, hey, here am I, send me. There's also a great thing in that verse that talks about who will go for us. If you go all the way back mm. into Genesis, I think it's chapter 2, where God creates man, he says, let us create man in our image. So it's basically the triune God talking to himself. And when he does, he uses this term, us. And he says, who, who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. Now, I had a pastor one time, and I love this, said, the great commission we have in Matthew 28 mm -hmm. says, go into all the world. And yeah. here it says, who will go for us? I made a note in my Bible right above that verse. It says, two-thirds of God's name is go. It's native, if you think of that. It's yeah. a major thing to God that he would have us go for him. And he wants to use us to go, same way he wants to use Isaiah to prophesy to his people. Now, I want to go on here, and I want to move very quickly. You with me so far? Yeah. So he says, go and tell the people. Okay? Now, here's the message. Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. And if, if we keep looking down, look down at, at, at these next verses. Look down at verse... 10. You're going to render the hearts of this people insensitive and their ears dull, their hearing, and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. In other words, they had not bent their hearts yet to really understand the message. So God says, I am not going to force you by making the message so strong that you cannot resist it. These are great verses about God's will. Now, if you look up some of these verses, Matthew 13, 13, and John 12, 37 through 40, talk about in Jesus' life, it talks about they didn't hear. 
They listened, but they didn't hear, and they looked, but they didn't see. In fact, I want you to turn over to one verse. Look over to John chapter 12, verse 40. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I will heal them. So this is the idea that until you soften your heart, and that goes back to the call, until you see the holiness of God and until you're convicted of your own sin and until you come and are willing to be commissioned, you are not ready to really be open to the gospel. And God is saying to Isaiah, you're going to be called to preach, to go, but the people are not going to listen to you. They're going to see and not see, and they're going to hear and not hear. And they're not going to understand with their hearts. And you're going to preach to them. I love verse 10. It says, the hearts of the people become insensitive and dull and dim. And that's non-believers today that they've heard the gospel. Maybe you've shared the gospel with a friend so often that they're just saying, oh, man, I don't want to hear it. Don't preach. Don't. I don't want to hear that. So it says, you're going to preach until they become insensitive. So the, the next question he asks is in verse 11. Now, what's the question that Isaiah asks? How long? But they, they're not going to hear. So how long am I supposed to do that? And basically, God says to him, and now uh, we won't even read those verses, because basically God's answer is, I want you to go and preach with your sanctified lips until the judgment is final. And at the very end, it says there's going to be a tenth of the people that are that faithful remnant. Remember when we talked about the faithful remnant, that there will always be a few people that believe. And he says, there's going to be some people who believe, but the majority of the people are going to become un insensitive, dull, and dim, and they're not going to listen to you. And But you're called to keep on preaching, even if people don't listen. So if you've been called you, and you say, man, they're just not listening to me. Some long time, for a long time, we did these videos and people didn't subscribe and they didn't like, they didn't make comments. And I thought, well, man, I, this is, I'm just talking to a microphone here. I'm not talking to anybody. Now God has started to really bring people around who are willing and anxious to hear about how to study the Bible. So I want to go to one more thing. One last thing in this verse, it says, it says, how long? And, and it basically says, until judgment. And then he says, in verse 13, yet there will be a tenth portion in it, and that in it is the land. See that line I did there? And it, the land, will again be subject to burning like a, a terabith or an oak. And this was interesting. Whose stump remains when it is felled, the holy seed is its stump. Now, what it's talking about there is they would light fires and burn up areas in order to reseed the area, to freshen the area. And these stumps, their roots were still there, so they would stump it and they would grow a new tree. So the stump is the seed of a new nation. So it's basically saying there's going to be a remnant of people who will believe you. There'll be a remnant of people in the land. And from that remnant, there will be a seed that grows into a whole new nation after my judgment. And you and I are part of that nation right now. Mm -hmm. We who are not a people have become the people of God. So it, it's a blessing that we see even in the call to Isaiah. Now to finish this out, I want to finish these five things. Let's go back here. So the first thing is we are confronted. Yeah. The second thing is we're convicted of our sin. The next thing is we're cleansed by his forgiveness. The next thing, we're challenged by the call. Do you see that? Who will yeah. go for us? So we're challenged. You don't answer a call if you don't feel challenged to a call. And the last one is we're commissioned. And that's I love that because this idea of being commissioned is a, a co-mission. We are sent on a mission, go, by God, and God is going to go with us as a co. In fact, you go to the Great Commission in Matthew 28, and it says, and I'll be with you. And in Acts, when it talks about going to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other ones, and he says, I'm going to go with you. 
So it is a co-mission. We're not just sent out on our own saying, good luck, buddy. Hope you use those lips. No, he goes with us to use those lips to his effect. In fact, it, I think whenever I think of that, I think of the verse where it talks about, don't worry about what you're going to say when you're witnessing to kings, because the Holy Spirit will give you the words. He's a co-missionary with you, and he's mm -hmm. going to help you with what to say in people. So we see these five steps and we can ask ourselves the question, am I amazed at God's holiness? Am I convicted of my own sin? Am I confronted with that sin? And am I convinced of my own forgiveness? And then lastly, have I, do I feel challenged and commissioned to take the message to people around us? It's a great New Testament. It goes right along with Matthew 28. Go. Two thirds of God's name is go. So, hope this was cool for you. Got a lot out of this, a small little chapter, but wow, it really applies to me and my life and how I want to be uh, a servant of God. And I want to answer God's call in my life and the steps I need to go through. And we can stop and ask ourselves have I gone through those steps? And am I willing to serve and go even if people don't? respond? Am I willing to obey God and just keep going? Because I'm going to make an impact in somebody. Yeah, those are good steps. Good reminder. Good reminder. Chapter six. Today we've been talking about answering God's call, the steps necessary in obeying God and going into the world with a message that people may hear or they may not, but we are going to be faithful in answering the call. I want to recommend a video to you along these lines. It's the, it's, the video is, what is your ministry calling? It's out of the book of Colossians, and I think it'll be a blessing to you. And listen, we're going to continue in our study in the book of Isaiah into chapter 7 next week. And until then, God bless you.